Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the history of SIGGRAPH art shows, interconnections, innovations, and insight. Uh, we do encourage on any photography or recording, feel free. And we're going to start this session with uh, hearing about the ACM SIGGRAPH Art Show archives. This is a collaborative effort that I have worked on with Bonnie Mitchell. My name is Jan Searleman. And uh, what you see here is a team of students from Bowling Green State University that have contributed to this project throughout the years. In uh, the picture on, the, uh, on your left, you'll see our typical meeting is uh, Bonnie in her office with the students. And I'm the little picture on the Skype window. I'm in California. So we, we collaborate by distance. And once a year, get to actually meet each other. I also want um, a shout out to the um, ACM History Fellowship, the ACM SIGGRAPH History Committee. Uh, the ACM SIGGRAPH Digital Arts Committee and Bowling Green uh, State University for their support for this project. We really felt as though this was an essential thing that SIGGRAPH should be doing. And I found this quote a sociologist without an archive is like a person without a memory. And I think the organization without an archive is in a similar situation. Um, this archive is a testament to the lives dedicated to pushing boundaries, reframing human issues using digital art as a medium, and refusing to acknowledge the word impossible. I'd like to bring you through a tour of what we've got going so far. The SIGGRAPH archive enables people to take a trip back in history. And so we have categorized the works that some of you have done or that you experience in these art shows over the years in lots of different ways. And so I'm going to bring you through a little tour through the artworks to get started with. I'm going to bring this over here so I'm not leaning so far. So first of all, we had to go through and create meaningful ways to tra traverse the information. And one of the things we did is begin to categorize the work, which is a complex task because some of the works fits in multiple categories. And sometimes it's a little bit of a stretch even to put it into any of these categories because they define their own categories. Um, but once you've clicked on those categories, you've got pages and pages and pages of information related to that particular category. And I'm talking about artworks. Each of these artworks, you can explore lots of information about it. So when you click on the page, you get the artist statement, the artists, the collaborators, the exhibit it was exhibited in. Um, and sometimes it's process information, technical information, uh, videos, links to the artist pages, lots and lots of information about the artwork. And you can view them large, small icons, lots of ways. We also have writings. And writings, again, have been categorized in four different ways. Um, not all the writings are full papers. We've got presentations that only exist as abstracts. But if we do go into the papers and you select um, a listing, a text listing of all the papers, you can scan through here and find works from 1981 to the present. And you click on those and you end up with a, uh, an extended abstract, um, what category it fits into the author, a little more information, and sometimes even the PDF, or a link to the ACM Digital Library. Now, we also enable people to access the information chronologically by going to the SIGGRAPH year that it was displayed. And so you can click on any of these. We go all the way back. And if anybody has a 1980 icon for the exhibition, please contact me, because I had to just like invent something that looked very retro. Um, <laughs> 
And so once you get there, you get information about the exhibition and uh, you know, who was involved, the committees, um, the theme, the jury, the writing reviewers, and then a big listing of all the information, including artwork and papers and presentations for that particular year. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Deanna Granada, who will talk a little bit more about the connections between the data. Okay, so starting with the contributors, I'm showing you, we have pages and pages, I believe it's 39 right now, um, of everyone who's contributed to SIGGRAPH in any year throughout the entire SIGGRAPH history. Um, so if you go to this other page, this is, when you select one of these letters here, you can choose any of the letters to organize so you're not scrolling through 39 pages, you can just choose, I want just the V's to see. So I can go last names of V's and you can see that they all show up for you. Um, another thing that we do have is a pull down. If you only want to look for jury members or authors or artists, we have that also. So here I have authors and it's a, just a much more narrowed search to be able to find what you're looking for as you uh, go through the archive. So we have Copper's page here as a very good example because on her page you can see everything that she has contributed from all of the roles that she's done to um, the amount of times that she's been a committee member to all of her artworks that have been involved in SIGGRAPH. So it's just one of those amazing things to see one of the more robust pages and how this can come fully around. Now I'm going to show you the back side. So we're using Caldera Easy Pods and Caldera Forms for this. Um, this is all the different uh, background pieces. It's not as, and you can just see that it's each separate form for each page that we have. And then this back side is where we choose uh, what it's going to be sorting. So for this one, it's the author works, and it's doing last name, first letter. So every time you select the letter, it selects only those last names. And it's just a much better way to organize and go through the data that we've collected here on this website. So now I'm going to hand it over to Dietrich Wiles, who is another back-end coder for me. Hi, so the main plug plugin that we use that uh, connects all of our data together is called Pods Post custom post types and taxonomies. And what that allows us to do is, for example, when we enter an artwork, we only have to enter it once, and then it gets like populated wherever throughout the site it needs to be, like exhibitions or people pages and so on. So kind of a quick run through from like back end to front end. These are all of our uh, pods, and these are like our different types of posts. And for example, when we go into an artwork, we have all of these fields that we create that can be anything from like just plain text fields to WYSIWYGs to fields we can upload images into. But the most important ones are the relationship fields, which are what connect it to other pods. So that's how the site is connected to each other. Another thing that pods does is taxonomies, which are these are the categories that you saw earlier with the contributor pages. And uh, this is the artwork categories, for example. And uh, these are like how the artworks are sorted. And you can see like on the side like the artworks that are entered into each category. These are templates that we created to uh, display the content that we put into these fields. These templates are a combination of HTML, CSS, PHP, and some co custom pods code. It's just an example of one of our templates. But well, this is where we call the information from the pods to display on the pages. And it checks like if there's information there, then we display it however we want. Just to show, for example, uh, when uh, a content person goes through to like enter information for an artwork, this is what they see. And they can uh, plug in like the exhibition it's from, the artworks, uh, any kind of information they have for it. There are a lot of empty fields, but the reason this is is so we can accommodate any type of artwork that we possibly can. 
and the finished product, when uh, all the pods information is uh, put through the template, gets displayed. Sorry, gets displayed like this to, uh, and you can see like all the information on the page. So I'll call Jane yeah. back up. Thank you, Dietrich. So we have this wealth of information, and it's all interconnected, and, and really is, it's really coming together. Uh, there's a few statistics. We have done 66 separate exhibitions because it's SIGGRAPH, it's also SIGGRAPH Asia and the Digital Art Committee online exhibitions. We have almost 4,000 people who have contributed to the art show or art papers throughout, uh, throughout the decades. We have over 3,900 artwork pages and over 6,885 images and videos. We also have some sound files as well. 290 writings and presentations and one collection. So more in that momentarily. I'd like to talk about now that we have this built, what's next? So we had the fortune of being uh, introduced to Everardo Reyes by Victoria Zabo, the chair of the Digital Arts C Committee. And uh, Everardo is the art papers chair this year, and he was interested in this notion of a collection. So many art museums and online exhibitions, et cetera, have this concept of a curated thematic collection of information. Uh, and Everardo has the first one here. His collection is known as the artworks of the 2019 art papers. So this is uh, Everardo's concept of it. You can see he's the curator. Uh, you can also see an overview of the idea behind that collection. And then you can see the artworks and, and artists and writers that are associated with, uh, with this. And uh, an interesting thing about this is that uh, the students uh, built in, to, uh, according to Everardo's direction, this list view of the artworks, but also retain the ability to click on a button and see gallery view of the same artworks. So uh, we appreciate that idea, Everardo, and hope to apply it um, throughout, our, um, throughout our content. Uh, collections are not restricted to artworks. You can have collections that mix artworks and papers and commentary, additional images, and so on. So we would like to have a call for uh, collections, for example, we spoke to Donna Cox this morning and she is interested in pursuing the idea of a collection of women in art, women in digital art, and create that collection. Uh, so that is one thing, yes, we're really happy about. <laughs> um, another thing we would like to be able to do with this is visualize this. So we're all visual people. So uh, a call for visual artists to be able to look at our information and present it in more interesting visual ways of seeing this. So another call will go out where we will try to contact people who would be interested in working with us uh, along these lines. So how can you help? How can you get involved? If you go to our main web page, you will see, if you scroll down a little bit, that we do need your help. Uh, you can see there are links, so if you want to make any corrections or improvements or suggestions about any artwork, about any person, um, et cetera, you can do that here. How are we doing on time? Right. We're doing well. Okay. So, um, so please help us out. We are uh, interested in our archive being complete, but we are missing images, particularly from the 80s. We are also interested, if you go to up here, if you go to collections on our menu, you'll see that another thing that we were thinking of doing is having all the information about the traveling art shows. 
So right now, that's just the beginning. It's a shell. Anyone who knows anything about the artworks that were in these traveling shows, maybe where they were exhibited, information like that, we would appreciate hearing about that. So. Um, Yes, and uh, a final comment before I close my part of this is uh, one of the students who has uh, joined our team, uh, Dylan McDonald, is at Bowling Green, and he is exploring how to take our data and export all of this to forms like JSON, like CSV, XML, again, information that could be used by the visual artists to be able to, um, to, to visualize these things. So, um, I, I think before we go on to the next half of our, um, of our presentation, if there are any questions, you, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes. We'll, we'll um, be quite upfront, this is just documentation. It's not really an archive of the actual artifacts. And our intent is to be, to create a usable resource for educators, researchers, um, that sort of thing. So it isn't a true archive of the artifacts that were produced. So for display reasons, we're just using HD format, yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, I just want to, uh, it's rather comment and suggestion uh, than a uh, question. Uh, we just finished with the Web3D uh, conference and uh, I would strongly recommend to connect with that community because that community that uh, nurtures international standards, uh, interchangeable things that will continue to live for decades. And that's where in our archive, we would like to, to, to live um, much, much longer than latest and greatest uh, um, format that, that somebody is promoting. So um, things that could be seen in 3D interactively on the web, uh, through the web, and live uh, much, much longer would be perfect fit for your effort. Thank you for that, Thank that you. suggestion. I just got back from Isaiah. How many people here were in Korea, South Korea, at Isaiah? Ah, oh, really? Okay. Me, all by myself? No, a couple? Okay, there we go. Um, and there was an amazing round table. It was at the end of the symposium, so I didn't expect anybody to show up. And the room filled. We had to get chairs from the next room. There were about 60 people in that room. And it was on archiving. And there were key uh, archivists from, you know, all over the world that were there as well as people just interested in the subject. And one of our goals is to create connections between all these digital art archives in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, and you know, Africa. Just let's let's all work together. So another comment is that um, we have been uh, working with how to use the infrastructure we have built for uh, other organizations, uh, perhaps uh, within other SIGs, uh, perhaps within SIGGRAPH itself and other venues. Uh, and if uh, you were at the ISEA presentation earlier, you'll see that as a, as a test case, we took this structure and are adapting it to an archive for the International Symposium for Electronic Arts. Uh, they have a similar uh, wealth of information on uh, many interesting electronic images and, and presentations, and, and, uh, and we are working on that project in parallel. Some of these students have contributed to that as well. Any more questions? Oh. Well, it's with my pleasure to introduce Copper Gillith. And um, who's okay. going to take us back in time? There we go. OK. <laughs> you got to go back to 1982. You don't have a cell phone. You don't have a laptop. <laughs> You're back in 1982. Okay. 
Good afternoon, I'm so happy to see you here. I was fortunate, or maybe unfortunate, to be nominated to chair both the 1982 and 1983 Exigraph exhibitions of computer art. Today, I will discuss the goals of these two exhibitions, showing you images of the installations, artworks, and some of the documents related to these events. I will then show, the best part of my presentation, a video compilation of excerpts of interviews of some of the artists who participated in the 82 exhibition in Boston. Just remember, this is 37 years ago. Okay, in 1982, I said, the goal for the 82 show was to create an exhibition of the latest experimental works by artists, scientists, and artist scientist teams. The exhibition celebrated the increasing access to electronic technology available to artists and the growing aesthetic awareness in computer graphics. Over a thousand entries for this juried exhibition arrived from all over the world. All the work was produced after January 1st, 1980. The 88 pieces in this show were diverse in style, medium, and technique, holding as a common thread the pursuit of artistic excellence. The use of computers in these works shows that the style is established by the artist and not identifiably derivative of the hardware. SIGGRAPH 82 was held at the Heinz Convention Center and the Sheraton Boston Hotel. The exhibition was installed in a series of connected meeting rooms at the hotel. The wall works and sculpture were in one area, another room was devoted to the video pieces, and a third area included a frame buffer setup and other installations needing dark spaces. Many of the artists involved in the installation, including Ron Resch, who is setting up his piece, were shown here. Some artists received support for their installations, including Jane Veter, right over there, <laughs> who interfaced a Polaroid printer to enable visitors to get a print of their modified self-portrait from her Warp It Out installation. Most of the artists were present for the exhibition. Pictured is M. M. Schwiller and Mike, Mar speak and Mike Marshall speaking with another artist at the opening. The goals for the 83 show were expanded to include a comprehensive traveling exhibition managed by committee member Joanne Culver. We were able to obtain three copies of most of the same artworks and thus create three versions of the show to have almost simultaneous exhibitions in Detroit, Michigan, Avignon, France, and Tokyo, Japan. <laughs> Afterwards, the shows traveled to another 30 locations. This was made possible by funding from SIGGRAPHT and the host institutions. In 83, we also wanted to create a larger, more connected exhibition space that would embody how much of the work was created on a light-emitting device, a monitor. Therefore, the show was installed in a darkened exhibition space so that we could hang individually lit hard, work, hard copy works integrated with monitor-based works. That's artist Rob Haynes working on the lighting. Everybody helped. On the left is the 83 catalog from Detroit, and on the right is the Japanese catalog. We evolved from no catalog in 1981, 22 images in the 82 catalog with three essays, 27 images in the Detroit catalog with three essays, and all the images in the 83 Japanese catalog. On the left is Darcy Gerbark's tile piece, and on the right is David Morris's sculpture located near the entrance to the exhibition. This is the frame buffer installation by Bob Holzman, Jim Blinn, and artist David M. Part of, this is part of the exhibition in Avignon, France. The Japan exhibition was installed in the Isetan Museum on the top of the Isetan department store. Seeing the poster signs for the exhibition in public transportation and along the streets in Tokyo showed the difference between how this work was advertised in Japan as compared with the USA. We had a more compact installation with low lighting so that the video works, the sculpture, the interactive installations, and the wall works were integrated into one contiguous space. During the SIGGRAPH 82 art show, we interviewed 30 artists and artist scientist researcher teams from the exhibition and several other artist scientists 
from the com computer graphics community. We wanted to capture their ideas and spoken words so they might provide insights to the actual works in the exhibition. John Maybe, a video artist in Chicago, was contracted to film the interviews, the show installation, and the exhibition opening. Louise Ledeen, Cynthia Goodman, Darcy Gerbark, myself, John Maybe, and Bill Etra did the interviewing. What you're going to see now is, an, is a, um, about a 12 minute and 30 second excerpt of these, these seven interviews. And I'd just like to say my former student, Hat Merlino, helped, helped fix up this 82 video. <laughs> <laughs> particularly the sound so that, um, and he did this edit so that, um, that it would be pleasurable, more pleasurable for you today. Um, is there any way we can get the lights down? Because this definitely looks better. Oh, no, not, <laughs> okay, okay, here we go. There wasn't an art show five years ago, at least that I know of, and I think the big step from last year's art show, which as I understand was the first one, uh, to this year was that there was the addition of uh, installations that effectively uh, took a jump from being still art kind of stuff to being that you put on the wall to having installations and a lot of videotapes and, and uh, a lot of still video images that uh, are looking very, very well on uh, high resolution monitors. Well. I, the thing that appears to me to be what's going on is that the museum, gallery, art world context cannot hold the popularization of a new technology that's spreading around the globe. And the idea of Seagraph is that it happens in a different location every year. And as a result, those who are on the frontier, either in the consumer front or on an industrial research front, a military front, or what have you, are so deeply interested in graphics, in making pictures, that they just go right through the old establishment world of the art system, of galleries, of museums, come together for a short time in a, in a funky hotel complex, and like, yeah. bam, there it is. That's the best we got. And here's an art show. Yeah. Bam, it's the best we got. And here's a fantastic computer graphics show that there is nothing yeah. that rivals it in the planet <clears throat> on the planet. And doesn't it seem like there's a greater reliance on the creative talent? Oh yeah. I mean here than we anything. have here yeah, to me right. this place strikes me as being a situation where we have comprehensivists. In other words, somebody who is not just hanging out as uh, an art director or an artist who does one thing, but somebody who participates at many different levels in the thing. You know, they make the art, right? They display the art. What has been really most challenging and exciting for me in terms of writing about the work on exhibition in the SIGGRAPH 82 Art Show has been the fact that until now so little serious art criticism has existed about the computer art field. And I think this, for the great part, has existed. There's been such a hesitancy among members of the art community to treat anything that has the word computer involved in it with seriousness. And I think this has as much to do with ignorance as fear, fear of the fact that a computer at some point could replace the artist. And I think the more that I've looked at the pieces in the exhibition and more that I've become familiar with the technology, the more essential I see the role of the artist is. And although the technology is what makes possible so many new methods for aesthetic exploration, the role of the artist is as essential as it ever was. I see that's going to be a serious problem because uh, computer graphics and video and film and, and even old-fashioned photography is just slowly, uh, old-fashioned photography has just been accepted and it's actually now one of the growing art collect collecting uh, sort of uh, interests that is happening in, in this particular year, last couple of years. So photography is now 75 years old and it's slowly been accepted. One can make a scenario where if we're lucky, we will all be well out of the way by the time they get around to collecting the work we're doing now. 
I, I make a joke with, with, uh, with collective friends that I said, if you were smart, I mean, I would go out and buy computer graphics art because it'll be just like early photography is suddenly being rediscovered. Okay, you know, if you were smart, you would invest in it now because people are practically giving it away, I mean, as, as it stands now. Uh, simply because nobody really appreciates it or even has any really basically even even an interest in it. There's a sort of a hostile interest in it. So one wonders how... I met how with uh, Namjoon Paik recently. He just had a show at the Whitney Museum. Yes. And we were discussing both video art and computer graphics. And yes. His comment, which I thought was quite interesting, was that he felt it wouldn't really make it as a collectible item until the display medium could hang up on a wall like a painting. Yeah. In other words, when yeah. the flat screen displays came out, it would be a whole different story. I find it a, an exciting field because um, this idea of synthesizing the sort of linear, rational quality. I do all my own programming, so that I like to do that. Right, and, but that's just one part of it. Right. And this is one part of the process. Right. So the, there you've got analytical elements along uh -huh. with, I make, t on, in an ongoing way, I make intuitive decisions as well. Uh -huh. But I'm also, I have to pair that with an analytical sort of mindset to get Do the a lot whole, of hemispheral right, jumps, I'm right. sure. I can, I'm beginning to think <laughs> of computer imagery as like mind imaging. And the computer's a mind tool as well as a hand tool. Uh -huh. um, I'm looking forward to touch systems, you know, I, I video digitizers and tablets are just essential for the artist. Mm -hmm. And getting away from the keyboard yeah. is no, going to be... Human engineering is certainly a factor. I think that mm -hmm. will take it to another level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the sensitivity of the systems, I think, is becoming such that the richness and the complexity of the images will begin to expand. I, I think we're all pioneers, and that's the other exciting aspect, is that there, there are no boundaries. There mm -hmm. are no... The you know, you can't do this. We'll yeah, do a lot better, but we can certainly have more We're fun. setting the pace, uh -huh. yeah, and we're providing direction. You yeah. know, which you can't really do uh -huh. um, if you're a printmaker, or a yeah. painter. You can, in a sense, but I think establishing the creative potential of a, of a tool um, is really important, an important role mm -hmm. for the artist, as well as an exciting concept. So um, I find it really exciting Good. as an area to work in. Five years ago, all you had were print pin plotters. Right? It's gone a long got, way. Well, yeah. it has, but, uh, but in, in a way, some of the most lovely work that's there is the plotter work. And it's very tough. Partly very because the, the, the choice of the plotter work, I think, is just extraordinarily sensitive. I mean, yeah. I've never seen such nice plotter work. Right. But I, I think <clears throat> your comment about, um, about there being a lot of process showing is is a very important one and i find working with a sophisticated graphic system that in fact it's very very difficult to get the sense of process in a static surface i mean and somewhere between uh, the static and the dynamic is really where the process occurs and i find that very very difficult to to get a sense of it's a more traditional sense of process than what I think is characteristic of computer graphics showing. And um, Mike this morning, uh, Mike Neymark and I went by uh, together, and he was very impressed, as was I, by the number of outputs, in effect, that were removed from direct computer output, but which were taken another step further, so that some of the small book prints yeah. that are hand-colored, uh, um, Ron's piece, uh, Ron Resch's, which, which, which requires hand intervention again. And uh, all those things have a very different relationship to the computer than the stuff that, that, that is directly a result of the process. I talk, getting it out is fantastic. Yeah. I talked to Stan Vanderbeek a bit, and I mean, I've known Stan for about 12 years, but I think there's something wonderful about the thought of using something as organic as the element of steam in conjunction with that wonderful linear stuff. And just, exactly. you know, the, yeah. the changes that you see, it goes from a black and white yeah. image to suddenly this wonderful rainbow mm -hmm. yeah. image, and yeah. the fact that it, it curves and swirls and goes off into the distance, and it's, it's a great yeah. feeling, and quite sensuous, I think. Yeah, very sensuous, oh, yeah. incredibly sensuous. So we need more shows like this. Right? Oh, the show itself, I mean, it's you know, incredible. Uh, commercials aside. <laughs> <laughs> I think the level here is phenomenal, and the, the fact that it will be a, a threshold 
which will be a kind of benchmark for much more impressive shows. And yes, the technology is coming along. Yes, the access is greater. We kept working with machines which became smaller and smaller, and at the same time, more powerful. And that is somehow the uh, reward that even though our machines do have a lot of limitations and we keep struggling along the fringes of those, sometimes with editing, you know, 16 frames one after the other because we don't have more storage right now. What I think makes a lot of difference in our work, um, as Frank said, is that the computer sits in our house and it's always there as sort of a reminder, here I am, you know, do something with me. Um, and it also allows me to continue to work out problems that I have if I don't get it at the, at the, you know, immediately. I don't feel that much pressured for time. If I'm slow with something, if I'm trying to figure out a problem or if I'm, I'm um, stuck, I can stop. I'm not using up my valuable computer time and come back to it again and again and again and get it in, you know, to the form I really want. So I think the um, lack of pressure of time and the lack of having to depend on other people to write algorithms makes quite a bit of difference. Pleasure. I mean, it's just, it's such freedom for a photographer to be able to work um, like a painter because you're literally, literally working with your hands and you're working on your image and you can see what's going to happen to it. So it was, it was like real freedom. One thing that I really was feel strongly about in terms of computer graphics and it's also working with computers as an artist is that the, um, I think that it's important that because computers have become what they are in our society, uh, almost a threat, a lot of people consider them uh, a threat, I think because they chew up your uh, telephone bills and they, people don't know what they are and a lot of people are afraid of them, but I think the artist can use the computer to make that connection on a human level. And I think the way I've worked with it, I've always tried to keep a human level in there somewhere rather than just totally isolating myself within the computer. I agree with that, that importance for sure. So it's almost like you have almost a, an obligation as an artist to create something that has a hint of, of humanity to it. Right. And to let people know and to actually create the aesthetic for you know the whatever mainstream or modernization and usage I mean they're getting all over the place and lots of little kids are getting addicted to Pac-Man games and all this other stuff and it's important to know that there's another side of it and I think in, in general computer art doesn't do that so I really felt compelled after studying computer art and studying the working with the computer to do that and I thought you succeeded important. beautifully thank you My personally, my favorite view, although you can see from the other side, is the curve. No, I like it better. Most people can see that same look on my face. <laughs> That's. <laughs> Most people see that same look on my face. OK, um, I came up with a few conclusions. And of course, each time I watch this and I talk to people, I have more conclusions. But I'm just going to stick with the ones I've got. Um, in 1982, I believe we succeeded in creating through an open call similar to the papers and panels at the conferences, an exhibition of computer-based wall work, sculptures, installations, and videos reflecting that moment in time. That was my goal. The interviews at the 1982 exhibition were part of the foundation that would lead to innovations in the future exhibitions. We expanded the viewing audience by taking the 83 exhibition to 30 locations in the USA, Canada, Europe, and Japan. When I reviewed the work to prepare this presentation, I could see the intersection of paper plotter and wall-based works, and also the intersection of video, film, and animation works. Transitions from film to video, hand animation to computer animation, plotter works to 3D works created by computer-controlled tools, and the expansion of output options for 2D works were all prevalent. 
Low-end computer systems like, Zgra like the Zgrass system, Apple, and the PC were offering artists a wider variety of output options, including video, still images, or interactive installations. Your story and your vision were important no matter what the resolution of your work. Finally, as Jean Youngblood said in his 1983 catalog essay, the true aesthetic significance of the computer will be revealed only when we begin to explore that which is unique to it regardless of whether the results are art-like or not or whether the art world acknowledges it. What is most unique about the computer is precisely its intelligence, that is, its interactivity. Thank you. Um, and um, <laughs> and um, of a couple of of a couple of last comments. Um, the images for the artwork for both of these exhibitions are are located in this wonderful project. The in interviews um, at a very small scale. Um, are in my original site that I built in 2007 at that location. Um, and uh, the last people's names, and, um, and this piece, what I'm showing today, will be on my Vimeo account. So I don't know when I'll get it uploaded, but the video, this video part of the interviews. Okay, and thank you for all the people here, some of whom who went over this lecture with me and gave me feedback. Okay, thank you. We questions. Have, yeah, we have time for some questions, dialogue. Yes. I've already handed over all the images, awesome. and uh, and there's some there's some corrections and things that have to be made to 82 and 83. The video is another whole issue. Okay, tell us what that means. No, 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 no I will. I, I don't have any problem with that. I was just thinking about how to say this diplomatically, something I'm not necessarily right, good at. Exactly. <laughs> so. We got permission to do these interviews in 1982, and we got rights to make this tape because that's how we have those great machines at the beginning, how you used to get your badges. We have the rights for that, and they gave me permission. But one of the problems that SIGGRAPH has run into as they've gone through their distribution mechanism is they never really asked for anybody's broadcast rights, which is essentially what it is putting it on the web. So I have writes as a professor and I could have it and will probably be have an archive at the University of Massachusetts because I can't turn it over to SIGGRAPH because they won't they won't do anything with it which is what they've done with the problem with the SIGGRAPH video review that they've basically buried most of this amazing resource that nobody can get to anymore so and we're tackling that through the ACM. It, it's an issue, because we want access to this material, all of us, right? Yeah. So we are tackling this through the ACM History Committee. Um, Jan and I got back, went to an archive workshop at the Babbage Institute, and um, it was the number one issue that was discussed, is working through the legality of releasing all of this early material. So it, it's important to us, and if she has it up there, we might link to you. I don't yeah, know, that's I mean, how I, the web works, right? We're, <laughs> we're just trying to figure out how we can not have it buried. I mean, I only gave you the excerpts of seven of the interviews. There's some, uh, you know, because, and I chose the interviews that you saw today because I was looking for people who were kind of talking a little more globally about the work, talking about their own work, but talking globally. I also um, am, was really hoping that Louise Ledeen was gonna be here today, and I'm sorry she isn't, because 
almost all the interviews were done that, that I chose by Louise, and she's really um, a really good interviewer, and she really got people to open up and talk about their work. So she's reviewed all my all the things I chose and given me suggestions. So I've, as usual with almost anything I do, there's all sorts of people who give me feedback. I need I need copious amounts of feedback. <laughs> there was another question um, here in the front. Yeah. Um, we had a very strong connection um, with Japan um, through, through Tom DeFonte and Lauren Hare. There was a very strong connection with Japan, okay? So once we had the show in Japan, um, uh, we then, they were able to help us come up with the other locations. Then we had a very big part of the exhibition, which, I, which was not simultaneously, almost the entire Detroit exhibition, was at the Ontario Science Center. Then we had a copy of the show that was in Avignon, and Alain Chenet and some other people, um, connections through France, got us connected. And at the time, I didn't realize that the most major um, theater festival happens in Avignon, France every summer. So we were a part of this major festival. Now that I spend half of my time in the south of France, I'm like even more impressed that we managed to get the SIGGRAPH art show there in, in 1983. Once it was in France, we had a bunch of opportunities for France, and then there's a series of them that are all, there's a series of them that are video only, a group that are only, I think that's, so anyway, it's really through it's really through all these connections at SIGGRAPH. Because you know, we were really, if you if you were to look at the 82 catalog and you would look at who's in there, you would go, you have a piece by Richard Voss and Benoit Mandelbrot, or you have a piece by, you know, this was a real artist scientist researcher exhibition. And of course everybody was there, you know, so it was a very um, you know, or Jim Blinn, Jim Blinn and Bob Hoffman and David M. doing this frame buffer thing. This was, you know, everybody was just trying to make it work, and we had the best people to make hardware work. I mean, they were all here. And the funding, too, was that um, We got a lot of funding from Japan, a lot of funding through that, 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 um, that process. And our catalog is, the catalog is just gorgeous this thick, thick catalog. Um, and we, got, we also got funding in France, too. And there was sick, and, and then there, were, there was funding, you know, that came from each of the institutions that, that, that brought it. And then did you actually have to raise some of those funds? No, I didn't raise any money. <laughs> I, just, I just spent, no, I just spent my life. I literally, I literally spent 50% of my time in 1982 and 1983 working on these. And I had a consulting job. They let me, I just, I worked all the time. It was not something I could do at this point in my life, but I did it. I had a great time. There, there were some, oh, sorry, there were some questions behind, but Joan, did you have oh. a quick one? No, no, well, I started graduate school in 1978. I was at the, I was in EVL. I was the first graduate. I was the first graduate of the, of the graduate program at University of Illinois at EVL. In 1979, was my first year volunteering. My job was to handle people who had problems with their registration. So I moved up the queue. <laughs> you know, I, I started at the. No, my first job, was when the SIGGRAPH video review started. I would, you would send in a three-quarter inch tape and we would make a copy from our three-quarter inch matter, matter, master onto your tape and mail it back to you, one of my graduate student jobs. And then I got to deal with problems. And then I was an AV volunteer. And, um, and then in, um, and then I graduated and I did some other, I had my work shown at the SIGGRAPH, 80, my piece, Skippy Peanut Butter Jars, was shown in the, th the electronic theater in 1980. Um, so, you know, and I taught, I taught my first workshop 
I remember being a terrified graduate, you know, just graduating and teaching a workshop at SIGGRAPH. So I mean, I sort of worked my way up, and I knew um, um, Darcy Gerbarg and a few other people pulled together the 81 show with work from the high technology show at the Library of Congress, and then they got Bob Holzman involved. They pulled together and they showed that it was something that was viable at SIGGRAPH. And then I got invited to, I was very organized. I mean, I, I still am. <laughs> and so they gave it to me. It was a big organizational thing. But my committee was Darcy Gerbarg, Louise Ledeen, um, uh, um, Michael Knoll, and a whole slew of other people that worked on it. And it was a real, you know, Darcy made the catalog work. Louise, Louise, ment Louise Ledeen mentored me. She mentored me on, okay, you're gonna send out these, you're gonna post this thing in Art in America and you're gonna post these things places to get works, but here's the list of 30 people you're gonna write emails to. <laughs> and you're gonna try to convince them they should be in this show. No, I mean, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna, I had an email in, in 1976. I had email. Also, there were friends. You know, they were just like, she, Louise Ledeen knew everybody in the, in, in the sort of video community. So there was a lot of, you know, I mean, most stuff went by, I mean, I have all the little letters from this. So, so you know, it was, it was a network, you know, getting people to, to send stuff in. So there were some questions in the back. We have about um, three or four mi minutes. Yes. Well, that's kind of why I wanted, um, I was so, they were so gracious to ask me to do this. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted people today to hear what people were saying in 1982 when they were in a, in a very different, a different place. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of the same things. I mean, I think that, um, I think that art work, I think that artists still, there are a group of artists that don't want anyone to know they use technology. There are, are, but there are plenty of places that artists doing amazing things are showing their work all over the world. And so that is very different. That's different. What people say might be, you know, might be, it, you know, some of it's the same. Now, did everybody go buy computer art in 1982, like Stan Vanderbeek said? Probably not, you know, but, you know, I don't know. I really loved what they all said. I mean, Tom was being very authentic and very clear and had vision that is lacking today. I, I like what they're saying, and people aren't saying it exactly. Right or wrong, I don't think I'm the only one who thinks that. It, I mean, each, each interview, they really nailed something. Well, we had. It's still, a, it's, it's still going on today, but they articulated. Yeah, they so were. Well. They were very articulate. Okay, Jane, this is scary. She's going to ask me a question. Oh God! Oh God! No, no. I, I, I was just going to uh, reflect on the fact that um, throughout the the uh, mid and 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 the rest of into from from this point on throughout the eighties. I was repeatedly invited to show my work in various places, and I uh, and uh, and and so or invited to enter a competition or something. But but I was repeated. My work was repeatedly um, invited to be shown, and I credit that to the SIGGRAPH art show and the fact that it traveled. Mm -hmm. All Wonderful. of a sudden. There were people right. in lots of places who went, oh, we could do this. Before we close this session, we have a little something for Copper to celebrate her special day. It is Copper's it's my birthday, birthday today. today. So we have a cupcake.
and as close to a copper colored candle as we could get. And we invite you if you'd like to sign the box. Yeah. I just have to, to say so. that I just have to say that I have spent so many birthdays at SIGGRAPH. <laughs> I was really kind of excited when they moved to August because it was like I could just not have my birthday, you know. And then it happened this year. But next year, it's not. My birthday's after SIGGRAPH. So I've had a lot of birthday adventures and parties that I won't share with you um, and at, at SIGGRAPH. But this is very, this is very nice. And um, well, I'm just happy. happy. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm happy that you're all here. And I'm happy that we're ending on time. Because that's always, a, that's always an important thing for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, okay. We hope you are also uh, able to come to the art show party tonight. It's in the art gallery. We passed around some posters um, about postcards, that. Yeah. Postcards, and uh, uh, I've got a cupcake. Definitely come see, uh, continue the conversations, and we welcome you to share your inputs and your insights with us. Thank you. Thank you.